redemption. With the Lord is plenteous, abundant, full redemption. I've always loved that scripture verse. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The Bible says that our God is not just a God of redemption. He's a God of plenteous redemption, abundant, full redemption. And those are sort of two, uh, Psalm 107 and Psalm 30 are sort of some introductory uh, uh, thoughts. Now, tonight we're going to just do three things. We're going to look at this word redemption and what it meant in the Old Testament. We're going to look at what it means in the New Testament. And then I'm going to give you, I think, a very important caveat for a series like this. Okay? For a series like this. Those are three things that we are going to do tonight. Look into the word, for different words, different meanings, and a caveat. Now, some of you may be sitting there thinking to yourself, you know, with a topic like redemption that's so inspirational, so motivational, so encouraging, why are we going to be plodding through the scriptures looking at all these different words for redemption? Why don't you tell us some inspirational stories or share some testimony or something like this? And the reason I'm not doing that tonight is because that's what the series, the next seven speakers are going to do. Tonight we're going to lay a biblical foundation. But the future speakers are going to be sharing stories of redemption from the Bible, namely Ruth and Joseph and the Apostle Paul. And then we're going to try something a little bit unique for the first time. We're going to have some speakers come in who are simply going to share their story, their testimony. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. And so the next seven speakers are going to be telling stories of redemption, whether from the Bible or their own personal journey. And so we hope that's a real encouragement to you. And so tonight, I'm not going to do that and steal their thunder. I'm simply going to lay out a biblical framework for this idea of redemption. What does it mean and what is it? You'll be hearing those great stories in the months ahead. So I'm excited to see kind of how that goes with, with people sharing testimony. Okay, so three things. Look at redemption in the Old Testament. Look at what it means in the New Testament and then give an important caveat about a series like this. Everybody tracking with me? Okay, good. All right, so let's start out in the Old Testament. And in doing some study for this, it was really, really fascinating. There are three main Hebrew words for redemption in the Old Testament. And I want to just say that redemption, in a biblical sense, was primarily, early on, a word that meant something to do with economics and finances. Okay? That's what the word redemption in the Old Testament started out meaning. A transaction, a financial, economic transaction. It's not quite what we mean today when we say redemption. But it's really, really interesting, and it's really important. So let's look at these three words. The three Hebrew words for redemption and what they mean in the Old Testament, okay? The first is the verb pada, P-A-D-A, pada, and it's a legal term. Again, these are not inspirational terms initially. They're financial, legal, transactional terms. And it's a, it's a word, a, a legal word concerning the price required to retain that which rightfully belongs to someone else, okay? You're thinking, boy, that seems kind of uh, technical, but that's what the word redemption meant, one of the main three ways. It's a legal term concerning the price required to retain that which rightfully belongs to someone else. You would redeem, that was called a redeeming. Uh, Numbers 18, 15 through 16 is an example of this. Um, and so let's read that together. And I'll just tell you that I'm going to read some of these passages in a little newer translation simply because these are hard to understand. And I'll tell you, I had to spend quite a bit of time on this first one, even reading it in different translations. Like, what exactly is it saying? I wasn't familiar with this term redeeming in this way. So here's what it says in Numbers 18, verses 15 through 16. It says this, well, uh, 14. It says, everything in Israel that is devoted to the Lord is yours. He's talking to the priests. God is talking to the priests. 
the first offspring of every womb, both man and animal, that is offered to the Lord is yours. But you must redeem every firstborn son and every firstborn male of unclean animals. When they are a month old, you must redeem them at the redemption price set at five shekels of silver, according to the sanctuary shekel, which weighs 20 giras. Now, I don't know exactly what 20 giras is, but I read this, I've read it multiple times, and I thought, I still don't know what, what it's saying. So here's what it's saying. The Old Testament law said that every firstborn male from a clean animal belonged to God, and it was sacrificed. It also said the firstborn male child belonged to the Lord, and that child was required to go serve and help the priests, the firstborn son. Unless the parents took some money and paid the priest as a substitute for giving their son to the priesthood. God made allowance. It was called redemption. I want to repeat that because it took me a while to get my mind around it. The firstborn son of every family, the Torah says, belonged to God. And the, he would be required to go serve as a priest or in the priest to help with the priesthood unless the parents paid five shekels to the priest, in which case God counted that as a substitute and let that child go with his family. It was kind of like paying to get them out of something, namely being a priest or serving in, in, in a priestly way. That was called redeeming the child. Okay? Isn't that interesting? It was kind of like, a, again, a way to get them out of something maybe they didn't really want their child to do necessarily. And God said, okay, if you pay me this price, it's okay, I'll count it as a substitute. That was called redeeming. Okay? Pada. Okay? Very interesting. The second one, the second Hebrew word that you read as translated redemption is this word ge'al. Ge'al. The verb ge'al is, again, a legal term for the deliverance of some person, property, or right to which one had a previous claim through family relation or possession. Again, this is another technical economic financial term. This was different than the first term. Remember, the first term was this child belongs, this uh, male firstborn belongs to God, but God would accept payment to get that child, that son, not be in the priesthood and come work for you on the farm or whatever it may be. That child never was really yours. It belonged to God. This second one is different. This second one is actually you had possession or your family had possession of something or someone and then it was taken into the possession of another and you could go and get that thing and bring it back. Pay a price to redeem that thing back to your family, back to your possession because you once owned it. Okay, that's very different than the first one. That was also called redeeming. Okay, let's look at the the scripture here and tied to this one. This is really interesting. Leviticus 25. This is an example where a, uh, a, a person, a child, a, 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 Jewish, a Jewish person was actually become, would become poor and on occasion someone who was non-Jewish, who was wealthy, would actually, because they were so poor, they would have to be sold into the slavery of that non-Jewish person. Okay, but listen to what it says. It's interesting. Okay, so we're in Leviticus. We're in chapter 25, verses 47 through 49. Here's what it says. Again, this is a little, little newer translation. It says, if an alien, or a, again, a national alien, if an alien or a temporary resident among you becomes rich, now listen to this, and one of your countrymen becomes poor, and sells himself to the alien living among you or to a member of the alien's clan. He retains the right of redemption. After he has sold himself, one of his relatives may redeem him. Okay? Ge'al. An uncle or cousin or any blood relative in his clan may redeem him. 
or if he prospers, he may even redeem himself. So what you have here is in the second sense of the word redemption is that you have someone who once belonged to a family, once belonged to a tribe or a clan, becoming poor, and being purchased over here by someone else. But God says this person or his family always has the right to pay a price to get that person back into the family where he or she belongs. That also is the word redemption. But you also see it's a financial transaction. That's the second way you understand redemption in the Old Testament. You have pada, you have ge'al, and then this third one is also really, really interesting. The meaning of the third verb that's translated redemption in the Old Testament is kapar, and it means to cover. It means to cover. Kapar means to cover, to cover sin, or atone, or make expiation or cleansing. Expiation just means cleansing, removal. They're also associated meanings. So again, this is, a, again, a transaction type of thing, but it's the third meaning of the word redemption in the Old Testament. Now listen to this one. Listen to this one. Let's go, look at our scripture example, Exodus 21.30. This may be one of the more interesting ones that we're going to look at tonight. Again, I'm just trying to help paint a picture. The word redemption in the Old Testament did not start out as this big motivational, wonderful thing. It started out in transactional financial terms, okay, which is important. So let's look at this example in Exodus 21, 30. This is, again, the idea of, of redemption from the word kapar. And it's very, I find it very interesting. I'll just, again, read it in a little bit newer translation. It says this. If a bull, if a bull, like a a male cow, if a bull gores a man or a woman to death, the bull must be stoned to death and its meat must not be eaten. But the owner of the bull will not be held responsible. Now listen to this. If, however, the bull has had the habit of goring, of goring people and the owner has been warned but has not kept it pinned up, and it kills a man or woman, the bull must be stoned, and the owner also must be put to death. So this is a very unique law, right? You know, just put it on there. The bull gores somebody, and the owner didn't quite realize what was happening, had never done it before, it's off the hook. However, if he knew that this bull might gore someone, and didn't have it pinned up, and it would do that, the owner would be held responsible. But here's where it gets interesting for our sake tonight. It says this, uh, however, well, the, the owner must be put to death. However, if payment is demanded of him, he may redeem his life by paying whatever is demanded. This is another, again, term used, translated as redemption. So what it means is this. This guy, by the law's definition, should be killed because he allowed his bull, which he knew was dangerous, to kill someone. But the Bible says if the person who maybe it was a, had a victim in their family, maybe the victim was a part of their family, he says, you know, I'm going to let you pay for this with money instead of your life. I will accept that. That was called being redeemed. In that particular case, This this has a different meaning than the other two, although it's somewhat related. What it meant was this. If you owed someone something because of a wrong you did or a sin you you committed, there were times when a price could be paid so that you wouldn't suffer the punishment of your sin or your act of wrongdoing. That word was also translated redeem. Redeem. And that's what it meant in a technical sense, in the Old Testament, okay? Financial transaction, very, very interesting. And it's important as we talk about Jesus. But eventually, in time, this idea of redemption began to morph and expand and took on a much broader meaning. And eventually the term became to mean deliverance 
or rescue. Which makes sense if you think about it, really. Think about the common thread of all these different transactions related to redemption. Somebody, like in that second example, somebody is in the possession of somebody else, and you kind of pull them out. In the third definition, the third meaning of redemption, somebody owes a debt, and you kind of rescue them from that debt by payment. You can see why the phrase eventually morphed into something broader, right? Redemption or deliverance. Rescue. And that's what the phrase eventually came to mean to the people of Israel. Now, in the Old Testament, with that broadened definition, by far, by far, by far, the most talked about and referred to act of redemption in the Old Testament is God's deliverance from slavery in Egypt. This by far is the most common usage of the word redemption in the Old Testament, and by far the most talked about act of redemption. If you were to ask a person in the Old Testament from Israel, say, complete this sentence, God is our redeemer because God delivered us from, they would have said, Egypt. God is our redeemer because he delivered us, he rescued us from Egypt. Far and away, that is the most common usage and thrust of the term in the Old Testament. Let's look at a couple scriptures that, that back this up. That's where you read about redemption the most. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 26. Deuteronomy chapter 9. There's, there's more we could have certainly could have used here. But look, let's look at Deuteronomy 9, verse 26. And I'll read this one in, in the King James. This is Moses. He says, I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord, God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed, delivered or rescued through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You ask an Israelite in the Old Testament, God is our redeemer because he delivered us from Egypt. That was how they would have thought about it for sure. Let's go to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 23. Verse 23. This is David's prayer. And he says this. Verse 23. I'll, I'll back it up. Verse 22. He says, Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make him a name or a great name, and to do for you great things and terrible for thy land before thy people, which thou hast redeemed to thee from Egypt, from the nations and their gods. What God, David said, is like you who has redeemed us from Egypt. Okay? One more scripture. And the reason we're doing several here is because it is the most common usage of the phrase redemption. It was the most prevalent way that the Old Testament people of God thought about redemption. It's he who delivered us from Egypt. Psalm 78, 42. This scripture... There's actually several references in, about redemption in this psalm, and the psalmist is upset that the people are forgetting that God is their redeemer. So let's just look at verse uh, 42. Well, verse 41, again, he's, he's, he's talking about his frustration with the people. He says, yes, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand nor the day when he delivered them, there's that word, he redeemed them from the enemy, how he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan. So again, this could, there's dozens and dozens of scriptures in the Psalms and the prophets. God is our redeemer because he delivered and rescued us from Egypt. They thought about redemption on a national scale. That's by far the most prevalent thinking about redemption in the Old Testament. Now, I don't want to give the impression that they only thought about redemption 
in terms of Egypt and God rescuing them from Egypt. Certainly there are examples of God redeeming individual people in their individual situations. This might be the way that you and I think about redemption. Not so much the Old Testament people, but certainly it is there that God does redeem people, individuals, and their situations. It says this on your handout. It says, although most often found in relation to the redemption of God's people, as we just talked about, the concept of redemption was also applied to individuals in distress or individuals in trouble. Okay? I'm going to repeat that. Although the thinking in the Old Testament is by far and away, when they thought about redemption, they thought about God redeeming them from Egypt, there certainly is a strand of thinking where God is redeeming individuals in times of trouble and distress. It is real, it's present in the Old Testament. I'm going to look at just a couple of them here. Genesis 48. Genesis 48. This is Joseph's father, Jacob, kind of giving a final blessing to Joseph. And he, he uses redemption in this phrase that God helped him in his individual situation and helped him in his individual distress. Look at Genesis 48, verse 16. It says, well, sorry, go back to 15. It says, and he, Jacob, he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me or protected me or delivered me from all evil or all harm, he says, bless the lads and let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So Jacob says that he attributes God and his angels to be those who redeemed him from all evil or protected or delivered him from harm. So it didn't just apply to the nation, it did apply to individuals. And Jacob says, I recognize that God has helped me in my own individual situation, in my time of distress, in my time of trouble. And we know Jacob had plenty of those. Let's go to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, verse 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 9. Again, God does deliver at a national level from Egypt, but he also delivers at an individual, personal level in an individual situation. Let's look at 2 Samuel, chapter 4, verse 9. 2 Samuel, chapter 4, verse 9. It says this, now, again, uh, I believe in this particular instance, uh, Saul is trying to pursue David and, and kill David. And David's men have just exacted some revenge on Saul. That's the context. Verse 9 says this, And David answered Rechab and Baana, his brother, the sons of Rimmon, the Berethite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity. Okay, redeemed my soul or delivered me out of all trouble. So David recognized that it was God who had delivered him as an individual in his particular affliction out of distress. Okay, the point there is this. This idea that God helps individuals in their time of trouble is certainly in the Old Testament. It's there. It's not as prevalent as being delivered as a nation from Egypt, but it is there. And that's how you and I tend to think about redemption. God working in our individual situations to deliver and protect and rescue. Okay? So I think that's really, really important. Now, one final thing that I found that was really, really interesting. In all of the Old Testament, okay, and I, I couldn't find any others. In all of the Old Testament, there is only one explicit Old Testament reference to redemption from sin. To redemption from sin, where it said, God will rescue Israel from sin. Again, that wasn't the thought in the Old Testament. 
God is our Redeemer because he rescued us from, it wasn't sin in the, it was Egypt. But there is one reference where it says God redeemed or rescued his people from sin. And lo and behold, we've actually already read that one reference. Remember Psalm 130? Let's go back to that. It's almost like this verse is almost like, um, I would call it almost like a gateway verse or a segue verse into the New Testament. Sort of like the verse that says, the just shall live by faith. This is an Old Testament, right? Here's what it said. Psalm 130. Let's go back to Psalm 130. Let's read verses 7 and 8. And in this passage is the one explicit reference to God delivering his people from sin. It says, Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Or said differently, he himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. That's really the only explicit passage where that Word redemption is tied, rescue, deliver from sin. And yet, as we transition into the New Testament, we will see that that is where the New Testament far and away focuses that God is our Redeemer because He has delivered us, not from Egypt, that's Old Testament. God is our Redeemer because He has delivered us from sin. This is the absolute, far and away, dominant use and dominant thrust of the idea of redemption in the New Testament. God is our Redeemer because He has delivered us from sin. Now you might be thinking to yourself, wow, those kind of seem different. In the Old Testament, the dominant thought was, God is our Redeemer because He delivered us from Egypt. And New Testament, God is our Redeemer because he delivered us from sin. Those seem pretty different. Actually, they're not. We don't have time to unpack this, but there are all kinds of beautiful New Testament connections that connect sin and slavery and bondage. Of course, Egypt, bondage, and slavery. There's lots of connections in the New Testament that say sin is like Egypt. We're held captive. So they're not as different as we might think, once we understand how the New Testament authors were thinking. But, as I mentioned, by far and away, the sense of redemption in the New Testament is apply, uh, uh, deliver us from sin. In your handout it says this, the New Testament takes all of those meanings of redemption, the pada, the ga'al, the kapar, takes all those meanings of redemption and applies them to Christ. Applies them to Christ. I think I put two blank lines on your handout. Is that what you see two blank lines? I want you to write this phrase. It's really important, okay? In the New Testament, Christ, Jesus Christ is the Redeemer in every sense of the word. Christ in the New Testament is the Redeemer in every sense of the term. That's why we spent so much time talking about Pada and Ge'ah and Kapar. Think about how Christ fulfills all three of those words that mean redemption in the Old Testament. Let's start with that first one. This is kind of a fascinating one. How did Christ fulfill this role of redemption in that first sense? Well, think about this. Most firstborn sons in Israel actually didn't go and serve as priests because their parents paid the five shekels and said, no, they'll stay with me. Here, priest, here's that five shekels. I'll take my son and we'll, he'll, he'll come with me. They bought him out of his priestly duty and his service. Remember, he belonged to God. Think about what the Bible says, particularly the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus Christ did not take the option to walk away from his obedience to the Lord. Remember, the parents could kind of redeem their son out of this Lord's service. And Jesus never asked to be redeemed. He never asked to have his role taken. 
He said, I belong to the Lord. He's my father. I'm his firstborn, only begotten son, and I am his, whatever he wants. He didn't pursue to get redeemed by somebody else, like most of his Israel brothers did. He stayed in his role as a priest. He wasn't redeemed. He didn't ask to be redeemed out of that. He accepted it. He leaned into it. Father, if there's any other way, but not my will, your will be done. He's faithful, redeemer in that sense. He didn't ask for someone to redeem him. He was the redeemer himself. Think about this second term. Remember, the second term, ge'al, means that somebody in, in your family uh, own, once owned something and it's been taken possession by something else. But redemption means that you went in and you brought that person back to the family, to where they belonged. Think about this. The scripture teaches that we were born and we were taken possession by sin, by darkness, by the devil. And Christ comes into that and he rescues and he redeems us out of that back to where we belong, the Lord. He fulfills that role of redeemer in that second sense. And then maybe the most obvious one, this third sense, kapar, to cover sin. Remember that instance of the bull. It's kind of a silly example. But that man's life was owed for the sin he had committed, the wrongdoing, his gross negligence. But a price could be paid and his life could be spared. Jesus is the redeemer who was the price himself to pay a debt that we couldn't pay. We had sinned. We had wronged. We deserve death. He said, no, Father, I'm willing to be the price that's paid to redeem, to kapar those who are condemned. Jesus in the New Testament is the redeemer in every sense of the word. That's how the New Testament authors saw him, as the rescuer, as the deliverer. He's the redeemer in every sense of of the word. Just a couple scriptures to, to show this is the case. Then we'll have that caveat and then we'll be done. But again, it all points back to Jesus. A few New Testament scriptures that make this point very clear. <clears throat> Galatians 3, 13. It says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, as it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree or hangs on a cross. So it says we deserve to curse. The curse, we were under the curse of the law. Christ came in, became a curse for us so that we could be set free from the curse. Covered a debt that we couldn't pay. Let's look at Ephesians 1.7. Forgiveness of sins. Again, delivered us from bondage. It says this, Ephesians 1.7. In whom, in Christ, we have redemption. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Through his blood, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It's been covered. It's been expiated, covered, washed away. That's redemption that we find in Christ. Colossians 1 Verses 13 through 14, just a few more. These are beautiful scriptures. It says, Christ who hath, it's talking about Christ, Christ hath delivered us from the power of darkness. That's what I mentioned earlier. When we were born and we sinned, we were taken possession by the devil and sin. And it says that he delivered us, he rescued us, he redeemed us from that power of darkness and hath translated us or taken us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Over and over, the New Testament says that Jesus is our rescuer. He bought us back with a price. He covered sin with the price. That was himself. He is a redeemer in every sense of the word. He didn't have someone buy him out of his role as Redeemer, he stayed obedient to the Father to redeem us, even though we did not deserve it.
In fact, Jesus said himself, so find all a few scriptures that are very important. Matthew 20, 28. Here's how Jesus talked about himself in terms of redemption. Here's what he said. Verse 27, Matthew 20. Whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom. A ransom. A redemption price for many. We are in the many. When he says, I gave my life as a ransom for many, that's us. He paid the price to buy us out of sin, to deliver us, to redeem us. Christ is our Redeemer in every sense of the word. So I want to close by just giving an important caveat as we close, as we celebrate Christ as the Redeemer. We can experience that. We can be born again. He's our Redeemer. But I want to go back and speak to that Old Testament concept where the word redemption also applies to individuals in our own unique situations. I want to just give a a caveat. That's very important for this series. Because we're going to be hearing a lot about those kinds of things. I'm sure we'll have people standing here saying, I had a problem, I was in deep trouble, and God delivered me. He rescued me. He redeemed my situation. I'm sure we're going to be hearing that. I don't know what the testimonies are going to be. I've not heard them, but I'm sure you're going to hear that. And those are awesome. Those are encouraging. However, I will say this. Sometimes when we hear those kinds of testimonies, we can leave here encouraged. We can also leave here a little bit discouraged because, well, if God redeemed their situation, why hasn't he redeemed mine? It's the dynamic, and this is real for me, to be honest with you. Let's just say, for example, there's been a hurricane, and there's 10 people that have, uh, uh, homes are destroyed, and you have one person whose home was never touched at all. And they come and they stand and they testify, rightly so, that God delivered them and their property from destruction, and they give a great testimony. And I'm thinking, I'll confess, but What about the other nine believers on the beach whose homes were wiped out? What do you do with them? And so again, I say, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, but I want to just frame this up so that we don't leave maybe a little bit discouraged. Well, why hasn't God done this for me? Or I haven't seen the redemption. I believe God redeems every situation. He's a God of plenteous redemption. So how do we think about this? Just a caveat and encouragement. I would say it this way. Redemption is such a rich topic, such a rich concept, such a deep move of God that redemption has multiple layers. Redemption has multiple layers. God is such a God of great redemption that there's multiple layers to it. Here's the first one. Again, it's forgive my simple thinking. Here's how I think about this. There's three layers to redemption. The first level is this, level one. It's when redemption is visible and immediate, or almost immediate. That's that first layer of redemption, where God delivers and rescues visibly and almost immediately. You see an example of this level of redemption in the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. You have a wayward son who's gone off, the Bible says lived riotously, done a terrible thing, he's off sinning, And in time, not too long, he comes to his senses and he comes back. And I'm sure that that father could stand and testify. My son was wayward. I prayed, I washed, and he came back. And he could share testimony. And he should share testimony. But that's layer one redemption, where a situation is hard and God delivers us, rescues us visibly, it's clear, and almost immediately, if not immediately. That's level one. And that's good. And we should testify. But that doesn't always happen. And so we go to level two redemption. And that is this. God is working to rescue and deliver. And his redemptive acts and work, it's visible, becomes visible, but only eventually. Only in time. 
I think of Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy. Timothy was written sort of towards the end of Paul's ministry, sort of towards the end of his life, and he's kind of looking back on his life. You remember this scripture. In this particular passage, he's saying, Timothy, I was once a blasphemer. I persecuted the church. I was a violent person. He's looking back on a very dark time of his life. And I'm sure Paul, for a long time, wondered, God, why did you allow me to commit such heinous sins against your people? Why did you allow me to blaspheme? But now, decades later, as he looks back on that very difficult season of his life, as a persecutor of God's people, he can say, many years later, I can see that God was redeeming the situation by showing people that if he could redeem me, he can redeem anybody. The chief of sinners, you remember this? So he's standing back decades later, looking at that dark season, and he can see it now. Ah, I can see what God was doing. He was showing everybody that with Saul, the persecutor, could become Paul. But it took him several decades to see that. God was working. He was redeeming. It became visible, but only eventually in time. Maybe that's where you are. And then finally, I have to say that there's a level three redemption, and that is where it actually never becomes visible. It never becomes visible. You never quite see this side of eternity what God was doing to redeem. You're decades later, you're looking back and you're saying, I just still don't understand what God was doing, why he didn't redeem, deliver, rescue. You still don't see it. That's okay. The Bible doesn't hide from that. There's a whole chapter devoted to this. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 talks about those who, who never had the promise redeemed. They were looking and that never came. It never came. And that's because Hebrews 11 reminds us that ultimately we walk by faith. We walk by faith. You may never see redemption in your situation, whatever it may be, this side of eternity. We walk by faith, not by sight. And the Bible doesn't hide from that. And so that's, that's what's before us tonight. There's level one, level two, and there's level three. But here's the encouragement we can draw. When we hear level one testimonies, and I'm sure we're going to hear lots of them, or level two throughout this series, let their testimony be an encouragement to us when we are kind of in a level three season. We haven't seen redemption. Maybe it's even been a while. We're looking back, I still don't understand. Let these testimonies encourage us that God is faithful to redeem even when we don't see it. And maybe when we'll never actually see it. Let these testimonies encourage us. It might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen a decade. You might never see it in your entire lifetime, but that's okay. God is a redeemer. It's his nature. It's his nature to redeem, to rescue, to deliver. We see that. Jesus, if there's any question about God's nature as a redeemer, look to Jesus. He is the redeemer in every sense of the word. And so be encouraged tonight as we kick off this series. I hope you're going to hear amazing stories. And I hope that you'll be encouraged that even if you haven't seen that amazing story yet in your life, in your hard situation, that God is still God of redemption. It's his nature. And if you question that, look to Jesus, who is our redeemer in every sense of the word. Maybe with that, we would ask a brother to close in prayer and then maybe sing a hymn or, sing a hymn or two.
Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we're just very thankful uh, to be able to close this time together um, in prayer with you. Um, we're just we're thankful for the opportunity we had to um, share fellowship around food. Just pray you would bless all the efforts that go into that. Um, and we're really thankful for, for the message tonight. Thankful for Brother Joe for um, pre- preparing and um, kicking off the series. Uh, we're just thankful to be reminded of uh, redemption on uh, just the multi, um, multiple different meanings of that word and the, the richness of the concept throughout the whole story of the Bible uh, and ultimately how it is fully fulfilled in, um, in Christ. And we're just so thankful for Christ and for um, how he redeems um, the hard things in life, um, but especially how he um, paid the price to cover our sins on the cross. So uh, we just want to thank you for um, sending him and for his willingness to die. And we just pray this all in his name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Alex. Darren, are there any uh, serious details you want to share, or are we good? Yeah, you might feel like, wow, my story isn't as special. My story isn't as 